This is Steel Hughes with the University of Tennessee Extension here in Murray County in Middle Tennessee. This is part of the priority team in Southern Middle Tennessee, the lunch series that we've been doing. This program starting and growing the small poultry flock is a program that we do uh, to help our producers as well as an orientation for our 4-H kids that participate in our chick chain in our county on a yearly basis. Small poultry flocks in the United States, according to the USDA, they report that 7% of U.S. households own a small flock. Of those flocks, the average size is about 49 birds, and there's about 138,000 small flocks in the U.S. So the first question we want to ask ourselves is why would we want to consider a small flock of poultry? Number one would be convenience. Maybe it's a hobby for us. Maybe as in terms of our 4-H program, we're educating youth. Maybe we want to produce meat for sale or for our own personal use. Same goes for egg production. So the first thing you have to do is decide what your objectives are. You want to start with the end in mind. And if you look at the photos, you'll see that egg production could be a choice. Meat production could be a choice. The final product, potentially fried chicken. You start out with the chicks on the lower left corner there, and then you want to grow them to adult birds. And at that point, as with the 4-H program, you might want to show them. Uh, you might want to sell them. You might want to develop an enterprise with those. You might want to have egg production. So there's a lot of different things you can do, but before you ever start and get the chicks, you need to have some things in place and specifically a plan for what you're going to do with the birds once they get old enough to do something with. Some of the considerations you want to think about include checking on zoning laws, your local zoning laws and federal zoning laws. In most cases, your local laws will determine what you do with your backyard flock. Every year I have people call and ask if, if they can keep chickens where they live and that would be something that you would need to check on the deed with or with your zoning uh, in the area you live. You want to keep good neighbor relations. If you have a rooster, for example, that crows in the morning and wakes your neighbors up and they like to sleep in, well that might create a small problem. You want to make sure you've got enough space and you want to make sure you've got a good coop design. You want to make sure that you have water and electricity uh, so that the birds have plenty of resources. You want to make sure that you have your market set up, whether that be for egg or meat, and then any other regulations that you might have to follow in terms of selling meat or poultry products. So the successful production might include things like sound animal care and management. You want to plan, like we've already mentioned, Management is what you will do throughout that process. You want to make sure that you feed them properly. We'll talk more about that in a moment. And biosecurity is very important. You want to prevent disease or control disease should they occur. And you want to make sure that uh, you do your best to keep from spreading that disease or bringing others into your uh, flock. So what kind of chickens would you like to have? Some folks would like to get those for egg production, and those are called layers. White leggerns uh, lay white eggs. Rhode Island Reds and Buff Orpingtons would produce brown eggs. And as you can see on the slides, the left slide is a white leggern. The middle one is Rhode Island Red and then Buff Orpington to the far right. So this slide is in here, uh, the layer budget. We show this slide particularly to our 4-H families in terms of orientation um, each year when before they uh, participate in our 4-H chick chain project. And the reason we show them this is to let them know that there are costs associated with doing any project. If you're doing this as a business, you need to figure out and get some budgets on what your costs are going in. And then you can help figure out what your profits may be as you come out. So as we look at this, some of the things that we want to point out, um, if we look at our cash expenses, in this case is for 25 hens for two years production, and 25 hens or 25 chicks, if you come across 
The price is $2 per chick for a total of $50. That's for your birds. And then your feed, if you look at the feed, you have starter, three bags, $13 a piece, $39. Coming on down, you have grower, five bags at $12 a bag is $60. And then you have layer feed, and you'll have as many as 80 bags at $11 a piece. Now this is 2010 information, so you can imagine that that has gone up uh, some. And the other expenses that you'll have could include your heat bulb, mileage to slaughter facility, slaughter fees if you take them somewhere to have that done. And so what you need to think about also is your other required resources, your startup cost, your feeder and water startup cost, and your labor. Most people discount their labor, but is if you're going to run a business enterprise, you need to think about what your time is going to be worth. So the second type of chicken we'd talk about would be a broiler, and those are for meat production. Cornish hens have light plumage, and they're more desirable. On the far left, Plymouth Rocks in the middle, and then White Jersey Giants to the right. There's other breeds you can get both for uh, broiler production and egg production, but these are some of the more common ones. If we take a look at this broiler budget, you can see that it's much different than the layer budget. You can see that in this case, coming down to the line where the chicks are, in this case we're getting 50 chicks. They're lesser priced, but they're still $50 because you're getting 50 of those at a dollar a piece. The feed cost, the starter, the grower, and the finisher, you won't have as much of that because your turnaround on the broilers is faster. Uh, you want to get those in there, grow them out, and then process and sell those. You still have a heat bulb. You still have slaughter facilities, slaughter fees, the housing startup costs, feeder and waterer costs, and then again, your labor there. So as you grow these birds out, you're going to cycle those through your facility much faster. The third kind of bird that you may want to get would be called a dual purpose. And that is a bird that is good for meat, a good meaty bird, as well as one that lays eggs well. We get those, we call those sex link breeds. And as you can see, if you will take a look to the right first, you'll see that that's a red star and it's crossed with a Rhode Island red to the far left and a white leghorn female in the middle. The black star is on the, the lower right corner and it's crossed with a Rhode Island red and then a barred rock. And those birds produce good eggs as well as quite a bit of meat. So what you have to think about as you get started, once those chicks come in, they're very young, uh, in our case, a couple days old, they still come to the post office just like our grandparents. And when they come in, they're created such that they're able to feed off of their body and out of the egg for a few hours until they get nourishment that they will need. So if you look at, as you get your new chicks in, you can see to the far left, what we're looking at here is brooding. And when you brood birds, you will need at least a half a square foot for up to six weeks. Now these birds, you gotta remember that they're gonna start small and you can put them in your hand, but within six weeks time, they'll have their feathers and be much larger. Broilers need one square foot of space per broiler when they're mature, and then layers need two to three, and I prefer the larger three square foot uh, per bird as they're mature. And also they will need an outside run and it's up to you as to how you want to uh, set that up. Uh, we'll talk about some options in just a few minutes. If you look on the lower left slides, you'll see that this brooder, there's lots of small chicks in there. You can see the waters um, there hanging down. If you look to the center, this is more like what a 4-H setup would look like or, or a home flock setup in many cases. Now there's not many chicks in that container, but you can see that overhead is a heat lamp. They have the feeder and then also the waterer. And we'll talk more about those requirements in a few moments. Over to the right, you have a few more chicks, but it looks like a wooden crate or a wooden box or maybe even a, uh, something inside a barn that's kind of closed off. But you can see they'll have a light, again, feed, 
and water. So when you're brooding your chicks, you want to make sure that you have draft-free ventilation for the brooding, particularly in the wintertime when it's cold. Um, if those chicks get into the water and get their uh, plumage wet, uh, they can freeze pretty easily. They don't have the protection of the feathers just yet. They need ventilation if it's in the summertime. Make sure they've got fresh air and oxygen. It also helps prevent ammonia buildup and CO2 buildup in the hot summer months. And uh, with that, the airflow, keeping that uh, humidity correct, prevents the moisture and prevents the growth of disease. So those are all uh, management practices that you need to think about as you're growing your poultry uh, at home. So as we're brooding, let's talk about the light. The first 24 hours, the light will help them find feed and water. And as you can see, like we've already shown these pictures, you can see that light is a heat lamp and it will help keep them warm uh, until they can uh, get old enough to have feathers. And we'll talk about how to manage that as well. So as you're brooding those chicks, in terms of the heat lamp, those baby chicks from day one and the first week, they need to be kept at 95 degrees. You can put a thermometer in there where they are. You need to be cautious as you want to make sure it's not in the way where they could uh, potentially break it or cause a problem there. But at the same time, you need to make sure that you try to keep these temperatures where these chicks need it to be. And as you can see, if you'll look at the list over here, the second week, you drop down to 90 degrees, the third week to 85, and each week you can drop down five degrees until these birds have their feathers and are, uh, can take care of themselves and can be put outside if need be. One thing I wanna point out on this brooder, if you'll see this hardware cloth on the top, one of the things that you want to do is you wanna make sure that even as baby chicks, these um, chicks are kept protected from predators. There are many cases where I have gotten calls where the cat or the dog or something has killed the baby chicks, and nine times out of ten it's because there has not been some protection for them. Um, maybe they think that the pet will not bother those, coming to find out that that's not the case at all. So putting a hardware cloth over here lets the heat in, keeps the air in. Um, you don't want to use anything like plastic or anything like that that would cut off the uh, oxygen level. And that may seem like common sense, but I have encountered situations where people have, have used materials that were inappropriate for that use. And uh, because of that, either it dehydrated the birds or overheated the birds. Um, and so there's a lot of problems that you can prevent and just think through what you need to do there. And this is why this orientation and this information is so helpful, especially to our first time 4-H kids getting chicks for the first time or even a homeowner who is getting chicks for the first time. So as you plan um, and you have your brooder set up, now in this case, these are round, but if you'll take a look at the left photo, you'll see that the temperature is right. The heat lamp is in the center, the waterers are spread out, and then also the feeders uh, are around in a circular fashion, uh, so there's plenty of those for the baby chicks to get to. And you can see, by the way, that the spacing is of the chicks throughout the brooder, that the heat lamp is set at about the right temperature. And you can do that just by raising or lowering that heat lamp. If it is too hot, you may want to shorten the cord. Uh, and when I say that, you may want to just wrap it around a broomstick or, or a hook or tie it overhead so that the uh, it's the right elevation from the brooder. If you look at the second photo, uh, photo B, you'll see that the temperature is too low and the chicks have gathered to the center. They're not getting enough heat. And what they're doing is they're crowding one another to try to preserve that heat. So that would be a good indication that your lamp is too far away and your temperature is not warm enough to raise those baby chicks. If you look at photo C, you'll see that the temperature in this case is too high. The chicks have gone to the outer perimeter of the brooder 
and there there are none underneath the lamp and all you would have to do in that case is just lift the lamp up just uh, tie the cord up again put it around a broomstick just some way to keep it at that elevation um, until they uh, get back in there like they are in photo one and then if you look at the picture uh, D you'll see that in this case it's too drafty in the brooder and you can see that by again the birds are crowding but they're crowding in one location um, in this in this photo to the top left but they're all in one location and they're all to one side of that brooder so all of these photos you have to pay attention to your baby chicks on a regular basis you can see that by lowering or raising that lamp you can adjust the temperature in there and again that thermometer will help you know that some other things that you will need in the brooder of course are waters and feeders and you can see various options here from uh, store-bought purchased options to homemade options you can see that uh, we've already seen this photo here on the bottom left you can see the water hanging from the from a rope there the feeder sitting down in there it looks like they've used the bottom of a small water as a feeder and then they've got this looks like either a heater uh, and then they've got light over to the side there these chicks are spread out fairly well in this container and if you look here you've got uh, store-bought uh, feeders uh, this is a fairly large one uh, below you've got one made from a bucket another one made from a bucket in the top center a homemade one it looks like made from a piece of PVC pipe and then the bottom right you've got some other options and sizes and those will need to change as those birds grow so as you're raising new chicks when you get those baby chicks and they come to you to begin with you will want to put one and a half cup of sugar per gallon of water in in kind of warm water because you'll need that sugar to dissolve and you'll need to give that to them from about three to five hours before their first feed now what I like to do is I like to continue uh, with that even to the six or eight hour period and also provide feed at about five hours or four to five hours so that they can start getting feed and then they still have that water and that sugar in that water helps build their systems up you can uh, purchase uh, material at the farm store that will do the same uh, that's got nutrients in it to help make those birds get off to a good start but you, this is a homemade uh, recipe here and it works very very well water is the cheapest and most neglected nutrient uh, and that's for all animals including humans we uh, as a human population typically don't get enough water and so uh, that is a really cheap nutrient that we can all use more of so in terms of your waters per 100 chicks now in our 4-H program our kids get either 12 or 25 but if you have a home uh, system, production system, you may get 50 or 100. And years ago, I understood that uh, in the 4-H program, when you participated in chick change, you would get 50. And, and even years behind that, you would get as many as 100 to raise. And they would be called straight run, where you had both hens and roosters in that mix. But at any rate, in terms of your waters for 100 chicks and you can do the math you can divide by two for 50 or uh, four for 25 or any other number you will need six one quart waterers the first week for that many chicks you will need six two gallon waterers for weeks two to four with 100 chicks and then you will need two five gallon waterers from week four on but what you want to make sure is you want to make sure that the um, chicks get clean fresh water on a daily basis do not let a bunch of trash get in the water uh, you're defeating the purpose not to have clean fresh water in terms of feed they will need starter feed until they're six weeks old broilers will need finisher until after that six week period and until they're processed layers will need a grower feed until they're 20 weeks old or until they start laying and then lastly the layers once they start laying right during that time period they will keep keep feeding them layer 
during their egg production uh, cycles. You want to avoid these mistakes. There's a few mistakes that people make and they're common mistakes and people just often don't think about um, these things. The waterers, you want to make sure you keep them off the ground. If they're up off the ground, you can hang them. If they're up off the ground, the chicks can't get into the water and the water does not get dirty as easily. You want to make sure you keep the water clean and fresh, which I've already mentioned. In terms of feeding, you want to make sure that you avoid crack corn and scratch feed. That does not have the nutrients in it that the starter, grower, layer, uh, and the feeds that they would need to grow out well, the, they just do not have the nutrients that are needed. Keeping those chicks healthy uh, will help reduce disease. It'll, it'll create a better resistance by keeping them healthy. If they don't have the nutrients they need, often they will pick feathers for the nutrients, and that will often lead to cannibalism where they peck on one another and then even kill one another. And then for sure you want to avoid feeding too little. Uh, it would be best to put feed out there and monitor that on a daily basis to see if they're cleaning that up. Uh, if they're cleaning it up, that would definitely mean that you would need to keep more out there. If they're not cleaning it up, it would mean that you've got an adequate supply, but as they grow, they will be eating more. So as you're feeding, um, in this particular case, this is a slide that shows feeding a dual purpose bird, and this is for 25 pullets by age. And so we already talked about a budget and the cost, and so from zero to six weeks, you will utilize about 100 pounds of starter for 25 pullets. From week six to 20, they will need about 400 pounds of grower, and again, that's for 25. And then once they start laying, and then on, you will feed about 100 pounds of layer for every two weeks. And for the first 20 weeks, those birds will eat about 20 pounds of feed each. So there's cost associated with, with this, and you need to make sure you plan. So as you're feeding your new chicks, one thing you can think about is your medicated feeds. Uh, you can give medicated feeds for coccidiosis, for example, which is an internal parasite. There is a withdrawal period before you can send those birds to market. Some of the conditions you may see if they have that, they may be sleepy or sluggish. Uh, they could be pale, meaning their, their uh, wattles and combs and whatnot would look, look rather um, light color as opposed to a deep, deep red. Their feathers would be ruffled and they're just unhealthy looking. In many cases, if birds are not getting enough feed, they might have a roadrunner type appearance where they just look thin and, and are unhealthy. You want to make sure you read the labels and follow the labels of any feed stuff. And if it's a medicated feed, for sure you need to follow the label. The label is always the law. And if you plan to sell those birds, you want to give them non-medicated feeds. And that's given prior to market time. So if they have a withdrawal period, you'll want to switch over to non-medicated feed for the appropriate amount of time before you market those. The next thing we want to talk about is the housing requirements. You need to protect your chickens from the weather, predators, injury, and also theft. And you can look, there's two different options. Actually, there's multiple options, but we have two on the slide in front of us. One is a rather old looking weathered coop with a small outside run pen. And the other is more of a coop that can be moved. It looks as though it's on wheels and the birds can go in and out of there and you can shut them up in there in the evening. But we'll take a look at some other options as well. So the housing requirements, nests are not needed for meat breeds of the birds, for the broilers. You do not need nests for those. Nests, however, do need to be available at 19 to 20 weeks uh, for the layers. You want to try to prevent laying on the floor, so the best way to do that is make sure they have a nest to get into. Both nest and roost need to be at least 24 inches above the floor, and if you have one 10 inch by 10 inch nest box per four to five birds, that should be adequate. More is okay. 
less could uh, cause some problems. You want to keep the boxes clean and you want to keep them separate from the roost. You can see uh, nest structures uh, on the bottom left. You can see this looks like a wooden nest structure. Uh, it is not up off of the floor like it should be. Uh, same way with the, um, the buckets in the middle. They're not off the, off the floor. Actually, none of these photos are up off the floor. But these are examples. You can look at five gallon buckets with the lid cut in half in the middle and then commercially produced metal ones to the right. So you can build those yourself or you can buy those. Also with the housing requirements, you want to be reminded that the roost is not for the meat only breeds. These birds would roost in trees if they were able to do so. But what you can do is you can put rods, poles, or branches two inches in diameter and you want to put at least six to seven inches of roost space per bird and the roost need to be higher than the nest. So if you have your nest two feet off the ground, you want to put your roost poles higher than that. And you can look at the, some of the choices here. There's lots of, lots of opportunities to do this, lots of different ways. You can see that there's a single roost pole in the bottom left slide. Um, I would call this a roost ladder coming up here. Lots of uh, uh, bars across there for them to get on sticks. And then on the far right, it's just a tree limb that someone has cut and put up in the top of their uh, coop. So there's lots of ways you can do that uh, and just use the one that works best for you. Lighting is very important. Artificial light is beneficial. It will help you maximize production, both in terms of growth and also in terms of egg laying. One 25 watt light for 40 square feet or one 40 watt light for 200 square feet is what is needed. White ceiling will reflect more light and create a more uh, daylight looking appearance. Lights will stimulate egg laying and egg production and uh, up to 14 hours per day is uh, it's a great thing to have and you'll maximize your egg production. Broilers can use anywhere from 10 to 24 hours of light. And basically what you're doing is you're uh, providing the opportunity for them to feel as though it is uh, daylight all the time and they will continue to uh, maximize production for you. And one way to, to uh, set that up is with an automatic timer. You can put it where it'll come on and go off as uh, the time changes in the location that you are. And you can look the bottom left slide. Again, this is probably more of a heat lamp hanging there. These are smaller birds, but if you can look on the right, you can see the white ceiling. This is commercial production here. And you can see the white ceiling and the bright lights. And again, in order to maximize your production, light will be very beneficial. Biosecurity is huge. Um, if you have healthy, sick birds, they're not going to produce for you. They're not going to produce meat. They're not going to produce eggs. They're going to spread disease. It'll make it difficult for the whole flock to do well for that reason. If you'll take a look at the bottom uh, where it's got the NPIP, that's a National Poultry Improvement Program. This label right here, uh, you should see on the uh, boxes that you get your chicks from. Uh, and they're working to make sure that things are disease free. And if you look to the right, there's another sticker here. Uh, the sticker is the same, but it's got uh, Pullerum typhoid clear state. And so that's a good indication that these, or that is an indication that these birds have come from a place that has a disease free or Pullerum typhoid free uh, facility. And in this case, that label indicates that their state is free. So you want to do your part to make sure that you prevent diseases as well. And the way you do that is you order from a reliable source and get healthy chicks. Make sure your house is clean. Make sure the poultry house is clean and the equipment is clean. If you will keep your feed in metal cans, it will help you prevent rodents. Make sure you repair any holes in the house, the poultry house, the coop, uh, any screen or wire. It will prevent birds and rodents from entering and they can carry disease. It'll also prevent insects from being a problem. Make sure you remove sick or dead birds and bury them. Uh, diseases, uh, once they get in your flock, 
Uh, they're difficult to control, so you want to do as much prevention to make sure that doesn't happen. Do not mix your birds. Control the insects. Insects, if they're biting insects, they can transmit disease from one animal to the other. Wear dedicated clothes. Wear clothes specifically to the coop. Make sure your hands are clean. If you have a sick bird or think one is sick, isolate that bird, get it away from the others. Confine the birds to a specific areas. Keep the areas clean around the coops and pastures. If you have weeds and you have trees around there, you gotta remember that that's where mice, rats, um, possum, raccoon, coyotes, dogs, all, cats, all these animals can hide in those tall weeds. So you wanna keep it clean, keep it clear around there. Do not create a habitat for them if you're trying to raise these chickens. And you wanna make sure that you enforce the rules. Whatever rules you've set aside for your place, you wanna keep those, uh, you wanna make sure everybody abides by those. If you want to prevent cannibalism, you can have the chicks de-beaked at the hatchery. You can do that at home also. It's not a difficult thing to do. You don't want to put too many birds in one space or overcrowd. We mentioned nutrient deficiencies back when we were talking about feeding cracked corn or scratch feed. It just doesn't have the nutrients to keep those birds where they need to be. Make sure you've got good ventilation. You don't want it to be drafty, especially in wintertime, but make sure you've got air um, good clean air that comes through there and any buildup of ammonia or CO2, you wanna make sure that that air moves out of your coop. Now, if you're a small producer and have a small spot, that's not as much of a problem as it is if you have more birds. Too little space causes overcrowding, we've already mentioned. Too much light, um, you can overdo that too. The sight of blood will create a situation where those birds will peck at that and it, the more they peck at it, the more blood there is. And oftentimes using a red light will make it where they cannot see that and know that, that it, it blends in um, and makes, it a, makes a situation where they're unable to see that and that will help. Prevention is the best medicine. Keep it from happening off the uh, get-go. External parasites can be a problem. Um, Mites, um, <laughs> in this slide we have mice, but also mites, M-I-T-E-S, and lice can be a problem. Uh, they will contribute to the overall poor health of a chicken. Internal parasites, including worms. There's some diseases that you could be need to be aware of. Merrick's disease, we get those treated at the hatchery. Uh, that's a virus. They lose weight. They become paralyzed and then they die. Foul pox is blisters and scabs on the combs and wattles. Newcastle disease is, a, is a, like bronchitis, a respiratory disease. And so all of these things, the way that you prevent these is by scouting your birds and knowing what you have there, notice any changes, and keeping good records is a good way to do that. So management, any birds that you need to call, if they're sick and you need to get them out of the flock, do that. Control the predators. They carry disease oftentimes. Sanitation, keeping things clean. A bleach solution uh, will help control some, some diseases and, and uh, problems that you may have. Control the insects and disease. Vaccinate the flock if you need it. Some of those uh, vaccinations uh, you can put in the feed and you can buy those at the farm store. Um, and you just want to keep a good sanitation process going. Scout your flock. Keep an eye on it on a daily basis. And again, I've already mentioned, you can keep records. And if you'll look, you'll see you've got snakes on the lower left eating the eggs. The top is a raccoon. Now that looks like a cute critter until he gets in your chicken coop one night and kills all of your birds. We've had that happen. The birds are, are free ranging here in the center. One of the problems with that is predator control. Uh, predators will get to those when they're out in the open like that. And if we look at Wile E. Coyote to the far right, if we remember uh, the cartoons with Wile E. Coyote in there, 
Um, most of those were silly cartoons, but at the same time, he's holding up a sign that says help. And most of the time, we wait too long. We're a little bullheaded. We wait too long before we ask for help on anything. And so if something changes and you're not sure of that, seek out some help. Call your extension agent. Uh, read some information on Google. Um, make sure that if you get information off the Internet, that it's extension-based information, and you can do that by doing a search and put extension publications on raising poultry or go to your land-grant university in your state specifically. Uh, in Tennessee, it's a University of Tennessee or Tennessee State, um, and there's, there's many. Uh, every state has a land-grant university, and that's where the extension service is located. You can put extension, poultry, and then your state, and you should get that information first. It's all research-based and good quality information. There's some other production systems that we want to talk about, and they all start the same as any other uh, production system. In some cases, the chicks are put out in pasture pens uh, at three weeks. Now, they don't fully have their feathers at three weeks. you got to remember that. There's fewer problems if you allow the feed to run out on a daily basis in these settings. The pens, you need one and a half square foot per mature bird. You know, we talked about a broiler being mature needing one square foot and up to three square foot for layers earlier. Day range pens need about almost two thirds a square foot per bird. Predators are a major problem and supplemental feeding uh, is also used and you can see in both of these cases, these birds are out where they can eat the seeds, uh, grass seeds, grass, insect, vegetation, whatever they can find there to eat. And then also to the right, this um, coop looks similar to the one we saw earlier. The one earlier was a little nicer looking, but this one uh, looks like it's been used a while. These birds come out into this field. It looks as though it's got a fence around it. But that's their coop for the night, and you would what you would do is you would lock them up in there at night to prevent the predators from being able to get into them. Now, as we look at different production systems, you can see these are pastured poultry here, and in processing, it'll be eight to ten weeks typically when you process for meat. The birds will be four to six pounds each. You want to make sure you plan and market carefully. You want to make sure you know your rules and regulations. Every state has a Department of Agriculture, and that's a great source for finding out what you can do legally or don't need to do. In Tennessee, we're fortunate to have the Center for Profitable Agriculture, which is a partnership between the University of Tennessee and the Tennessee Farm Bureau. Uh, they've got several pieces of information to help uh, with, with markets, farmers markets, selling meat off the farm, selling eggs from the farm, and those sorts of things. If you look down here at the bottom two photos, you can see the housing here on the left, um, but you can also see the electric fence probably, um, or the fence that surrounds the area, and you can see all the birds out there, and they come out and they can eat on a daily basis, and you can supplemental, supplement their feed. On the right is a smaller scale, it looks like. It looks like there's fewer birds there, but you can see the waterers sitting out there. They've got a cover. And these two setups, uh, definitely predators could be a problem. It's open overhead um, where hawks could become a problem. And I'm sure if you're not too careful, coyotes or dogs or cats could get into that. Uh, and again, um, you want to uh, do the best you can to keep that from happening. If you have a pastured poultry pen, like we do here at the top, um, or something like a chicken tractor is something that you would move on a daily basis. Uh, it doesn't have a floor in it, you move it daily. And all you have to do is just, uh, you can see the birds in this particular pen. You just have to move that pen enough to get it to new food source for the day. So you wouldn't have to move that. Let's assume it's 15 by 15. Uh, I'm not sure what the size is. You just have to move it about 15 feet, but you would need to move it as they would pick the grass and insects out um, underneath the pen there for sure. Uh, day range, you have movable houses, uh, you have electric netting, and you have, a, have it set up in paddocks. 
And so um, you, again, move the birds on a daily basis. You move them around, give them new fresh food source on a daily basis so they don't wear out and beat the field down to the ground. Chicken tractor is a movable pen. Um, I guess you could call all of them movable pens if you wanted to, or chicken tractors if you chose to do so. But in this case, uh, you've got a pen, they stay in that pen. Uh, they're not free range, they're not pastured per se, uh, where they get out and they roam around. They stay inside, they eat this area. Again, you move them on a daily basis. In the bottom right, you have free range. You have it on skids or egg mobiles, and you move those regularly. And what you do is, um, I don't know if there's a fence around this particular area or not, but you can see that the chickens, they have shade underneath the coop there, and they can also walk up and get in the coop into the chicken house, and it can be moved on a daily basis, and they can go in and out as they choose to do so. Yarding is a situation where you have a stationary house, but you have um, areas for them to have access to pasture and they can get out. And you can see that the ground is pretty bare, although um, birds do need to have uh, some grit, for example. Uh, it helps in the crop with them breaking down the food. But at the same time, the, um, when the ground's beat down like this, they don't have the grass or the insects that they would get in some of the other settings. Of course, if you're feeding uh, food uh, from a bag, you know, they wouldn't have that either, but you have to decide what kind of setup you want and you have to follow through with that. As we look at this slide right here, you'll see that um, there are several photos here. And uh, anytime you get into doing something in the ag world, you find that there's some humorous things about that. And these are a few cartoons um, and, and a few photos where people do some pretty unusual things, for example, coloring the chicks. Uh, the question is always posed in the top center, who, who came first, the chicken or the egg? And this would be the doctor's office. Then you have kids playing with eggs. Um, agriculture is a great way to educate your kids on some of the natural processes we have. Um, you know, of course, we have the farmer talking about the hard boiled eggs. Uh, have the chicken in the hot tub, decorative Easter eggs, and then input, output, and kaput. And so that would be a um, uh, that would be a humorous cartoon where you put the feed in, you get the egg out, and then kaput, of course, is where you turn that chicken into uh, usable meat. So another thing that you need to think about as you get in, especially if you're doing egg production, is the egg handling. And is that something you want to do? You need to have your market, uh, and you need to develop a plan with objectives and know your regulations. Uh, many of our 4-H youth and, and local producers, you know, they have enough hens that they sell eggs off of the farm, and uh, they sell mostly to neighbors and friends and things like that. But if you're gonna ramp it up in particular uh, with the eggs, you need to be able to know what size eggs that you have and you can see that they start, the largest being jumbo, down to extra large, then large, medium, small, and peewee, and the size of those eggs based on ounces. The Tennessee Department of Agriculture, you do not have to have a permit if you have less than 3,000 birds in terms of, of eggs. Uh, now, I don't think that has changed. I think that's still correct. And um, no permit is needed to sell those eggs and there's no routine inspection required. Um, and so you wanna make sure you know your regulations before you get started because you don't wanna have a bunch of eggs and then not be able to sell them. In terms of keeping the eggs clean, the eggs are typically dirtier in a free, free range system as much as 30% dirtier. Pallet straw uh, and gravel can help keep feet clean as the birds are walking around. Um, and that's outside, of course, straw and clean nest material can be used inside to help keep those eggs clean. You don't want your hens sleeping in the nest box. Uh, the nest box needs to be slightly darker. You don't want quite as much light in the nest box. You want those hens to be comfortable in there, but at the same time, you don't want them to stay in there. You want them to get in, lay their eggs, and then get out. 
you want to prevent broken eggs. Uh, obviously, your production, uh, you're trying to have good viable eggs, and if they're broken, uh, you don't want to be selling broken eggs. So what you can do is you can have nests with slopes in the bottom. Uh, you need to collect them often, at least daily, and then you allow access only in the morning. Um, and so the access in the morning allows you to go in there and get those. Um, and we'll, uh, you can make your collection one time a day and then you're finished for that day. You want to pro provide plenty of roost space. You want to prevent laying on the floor by having nest boxes. Um, you also want to reduce the light in the nest box like I have already mentioned. Eggs are typically laid within the first hours of light. You want to keep the eggs at about 60 degrees Fahrenheit with 70% humidity before you clean them. You don't want them to sweat. Uh, you want to separate the good eggs from bad eggs and you want to make sure you have good air circulation uh, where those eggs are so they can stay dry and not sweat because those eggs, um, you know, they could be warm on the inside, cool on the outside, and that would cause condensation or sweating. Egg collection is labor intensive. USDA packs eggs 30 days within laying. High quality eggs are packed three to seven days within laying. And depending on the size of your operation, I expect you'll be able to do that in the shorter time period. And you definitely don't want to store those with onions or citrus or anything that they would take the odor on. Um, nobody wants to get an egg that smells like an onion. Eggs have a natural defense cuticle on the outside. Uh, you want to spend as little time cleaning each egg as possible. If they're super dirty, you uh, want to discard those. Um, you might want to wash them and use them immediately yourself. Uh, a dry, clean brush, sponge, or sandpaper can be used. Of course, you don't want the sandpaper being too... So as you're cleaning your eggs, a continuous flow of water, a potable water, uh, is, is good to have. Again, you don't want to store those with anything that they will take on the odor from. Uh, in an older production system, there was no washing and no refrigeration, uh, but that has changed now, and uh, cleaning those eggs and uh, keeping them refrigerated is the best practice. In egg cleaning, you can pre-wet them by spraying with water that's 104 degrees, washing 90 plus degree water, uh, not more than 40 degrees warmer than the egg, and uh, but at least 20 degrees warmer than the egg. And what that will do is that will help, um, actually, it helps when you wash them in hotter water, it helps the inside of the egg push push on the um, egg shell and help keep the microbes from entering in through the shell. In egg cleaning, you want to rinse your rinse water to be warmer than the egg. You want to sanitize and dry. So another process that you want to consider and do when you're trying to sell eggs is you want to candle those eggs, which means basically putting a light where you can see inside the egg. There may be an embryo if you have roosters in your flock you could have blood spots, which are undesirable, uh, or the eggs could be cracked, which could allow uh, microbes, bacteria, things to get inside that egg that might cause someone to get sick, and you don't want to be selling those eggs uh, or using those eggs. The grading is on the quality, the size, and the weight. And if you look, the grades, when you candle, you've got a double A grade, an A grade, and B grade, and those are all based on the size of the air cell. Double A grade has a small air cell, A, uh, medium size, B, much larger. And then we've already talked about the weight being jumbo, extra large, large, medium, small, and peewee. And it's best if you can put those eggs in you. As you look at the small scale egg handling, you can see that grading, the quality, is done by candling to see about the air cell. The size um, also, and the weight, you can look on the top right. This is an old version, an older um, scale for an egg. And my granddad had one like that. And it will tell you, uh, you just put the egg on there and it'll tell you the size uh, and the weight of the egg. And then the bottom right is a candler, a commercial candler, uh, the blue machine there, where you can look into that egg 
um, and that's a much a much nicer system but you can make your own like the can with a lot you want to store the eggs you want to keep them at 45 degrees with 70 to 85 percent humidity you can keep them up to three months a standard refrigerator will only allow you to keep them five weeks so as you're processing poultry as opposed to the eggs um, producing ready to cook poultry involves several steps one being pre-slaughter which is catching and transporting immobilizing which is killing and bleeding feather removal which would be scalding and picking removal of the head all glands and feet evisceration which would be removing the entrails from inside the body you'd want to chill those chilling uh, the carcass you cut up the bone or further process if that's what you do some people uh, will sell those full carcasses you want to age package and you want to be able to store so pre-slaughter catching and transport you want to process at four and a half pounds of live weight you want to withhold the feed eight to twelve hours uh, we'll share with you why you do that in just a moment you'll need to catch and load those if you're taking them to slaughterhouse or even if you're going to process them yourself you can do them all at once or you can just do your largest birds and then uh, go down the line that way if you catch them at night or early morning it'll make it much easier um, you can transport them or you can do it at home like I've already mentioned but you want to reduce the stress as much as possible and the more that you chase them around or disturb them um, you're creating a stressful situation so you want to be as calm uh, and keep them as calm as you can while you catch them if you do that morning or at night you want to immobilize kill and bleed those birds uh, you want to use a cone to put the bird in upside down that could be a stainless purchase comb or actually a traffic comb if you look in the center there that's a homemade operation stunning is usually not done on a small scale but those cones will help prevent the birds from flapping uh, when you cut their neck you don't want to sever their spine or their esophagus and the bleeding out of the carcass will take about three minutes you want to remove the feathers uh, and you do that by scalding them and then picking the quality of the pick is related to the scald so the better the scald easier it'll be to remove those feathers you want to put them in hot potable water uh, some people hand pick some use mechanical pickers and these both below are photos of a commercial picker and then the one to the right is a homemade picker out of a plastic barrel with rubber fingers well water you've got to, if you use well water you need to make sure it meets um, drinking standards because you want to make sure that that does not have something in it that contaminate those carcass and as you scald scalding will loosen the feathers so that they're easier to pluck you'll need to remove the head the oil glands and feet you'll cut the heads off remove the feet at the knee joint and then the oil gland will need to be cut out and it's at the top of the tail and you can see in these photos you can see the cones uh, the plucker the scalders and containers to keep them in um, and also on the right side you can see where they're being processed in a small production facility evisceration you want to cut around the vent you want to open the body up which will also help with the cooling of the carcass remove the organs now a moment ago I mentioned not feeding for several hours prior to uh, slaughter one gram of their gut has a million bacteria and that's why you withdraw the feed and that will help reduce problems it'll help reduce the contamination problems which is always a concern and then you will want to get the heart liver gizzards collected and you'll want to wash the carcass at that point once that's done you'll want to make sure that you uh, package or, or chill those and what you'll do is the lower the temperature to reduce the microbial growth USD say, USDA says to reduce the temperature to 40 degrees four hours for a four pound broiler six for a four to six pound broiler eight for an eight pounder or a turkey you can use chilled water take the temperature in the breast air chilled is used in other countries but it takes longer so you'll cut up the bone and further process most farms um, have on farm sales of the whole carcass the industry is 70 percent is sold as parts 
Um, you don't want to deep on for four hours. You want to make sure it's cool for four hours. The industry is automated. Small plants will debone manually. 65 to 80 degrees you want to in slaughter areas. 50 degrees or less in processing areas. 30 degrees or less for cooler and shipping dock. Uh, you want to portion, form, cook, cure, smoke, brine. There's lots of different ways that you can um, process those. Uh, chickens, depending on your scale and how much you want to get in. You want to age the birds. The tenderness of the meat is related to the aging. You want to age at least four hours before you eat or freeze. Packaging. You want to package quickly after they have been chilled. Most farms sell directly to their consumers. They put in a plastic bag, they weigh, and then they sell to the consumer. And consumers must eat or freeze within six hours. And uh, that will help with uh, problems with uh, health issues or sanitation issues. Storage can be an on-farm refrigerator freezer. 80% of poultry is sold fresh. Freezing will extend the shelf life. You don't want to freeze any longer than six months. The quality of product declines after that. You may have a delivery or distribution option. You want to make sure you clean up with soap and hot water and sanitize everything. Um, waste management it is important. You want to make sure that your wastewater has a place to go that will not contaminate anything else. And then any parts that you're not using, you want to make sure that they're rendered or composted. Uh, that concludes our presentation for today. If anybody has questions, they can contact their local extension office. Uh, there is a University of Tennessee extension office in every county in the state of Tennessee. Uh, you can also look up, if you're in another state, you can look up your land-grant university and find the extension office closest to you. Uh, other than that, all have a good day and thank you for watching.